Hey everyone, so as you can tell, I have a new camera, and a new haircut, and a well, new shirt. Well, hopefully I have a new shirt. Alright, so we left off around the Treaty of Paris, so let's just do a quick recap for the Treaty of Paris. The Treaty of Paris is 1763. It, en it ended the war. Uh, new France turned over to Britain, reduced the boundaries of Quebec, and Britain needs stability over former Fran uh, French citizens. So, 1763 and beyond, we see the American Revolution, which means no competition in Newfoundland fishing. Newfoundland is getting supplies from New England, and they have to become self-dependent, uh, so this means that the population in Newfoundland falls. Between 1760 and 1802, we have the British Conquest. The British Conquest means that French merchants leave, British merchants enter, and a French card money becomes worthless. Remember this card money that we talked about earlier, that it was uh, money based on faith, and when it became worthless, it had no value. So anyone holding this money really lost a lot of cash. So 1774, we see the Quebec Act, so that's 1774 Quebec Act. And what the Quebec Act does, it extends Quebec's borders, and it legitimizes French language and Roman Catholic religions. 1786, we see John Molson establishes a brewery. Uh, he is the first to export spirits to Britain, and he opens a lumber yard to avoid shortages. He is becoming self-sufficient. 1791, we have the Constitution Act. The Constitution Act splits the St. Lawrence and the Great Lakes into Upper and Lower Canada. Now remember that Upper Canada is actually really south and Lower Canada is actually really north. It's switched. The Constitution Act also, um, the French and English differences in language, religion, and legal systems are legitimized. Lower Canada, there's no seigneurial system anymore. It is freehold now. And that, remember, that's 1791. No seigneurial system, now it is freehold. Road systems developed and there's less dependence on river systems. One of the problems with river systems is in the winter they freeze. Now with the number of road systems developing, the number of towns begins to increase because you can travel further with less frictions of distance. 1793 to 1815, there is war in Europe again. The Spanish markets for fish are closed for 12 years. This means the price of fish drops as there is now an excess supply with that market being cut off, so there's less of a demand. Still at this time, Britain eases no New England import policy, um, new, or erases no New England import policy, and this means that Newfoundland rebounds. During this time also, Americans begin to move into, north, uh, into, the, into the north, which is the Niagara area, um, because the land in America is beginning to fill up. Now in the late 1700s, we have economic growth due to British expenditures. The British build garrisons. Now with them building garrisons, they have to house troops. And with housing troops, the troops need supplies. They have a demand for food, they have a demand for clothing. The only thing that Britain supplies itself is munitions and weapons. The local businesses supplied the garrisons completely. Around the 1700s, Quebec also has a wheat boom. And later on, we'll see how the wheat midge devastates Quebec's wheat boom. Now, in 1809, Quebec no longer exports wheat. That was short-lived. John Molson begins buying steamboats for his fleet. Yet again, he is becoming more self-sufficient. In 1812, well, we have the War of 1812, and it is the Americans versus the British. And it is due to territorial conflict and due to trade, as we mentioned earlier. Um, it's because the Americans are moving into the Niagara area. Around 1812, fur is now only 10% of Canada's exports. As you remember before, it was the major staple of interest. It was the backbone of Canada. Now, it is only worth 10% of Canada's exports. Timber replaces fur as the big export. As we said, Canada has a lot of forests and a lot of the trees were great for building masts on the ships. And uh, the increased demand of timber is due to war. 1815, America begins to crowd Newfoundland fishing space. There are two kinds of fishers at this time, 1815. There are stationers and there are floaters. Up to 1820, planters, they owned buildings 
and boats and hired crews to fish. So we have the stationers, we have the floaters, and we have the planters know what each of them do. Britain is dominating the economy at this time. Timber is a volatile staple and is dependent on Britain's business cycle. Yet again, as any staple, it is volatile and dependent on the outside tastes of the world. It is very subject to externalities. Forward linkages that are derived from timber are sawmills. New Brunswick is big on shipbuilding. 50% of the ships built in New Brunswick went to Britain. New Brunswick had great wood for building ships and for building the masts. In 1816, timber duties become permanent. Britain encourages buying colonial timber. Yet again, they're encouraging the development of their hinterland, which is Canada. Nova Scotia pressures Britain to send Navy ships to keep U.S. ships three miles away from shore. The, the U.S. ships were invading our area. Now, 1817, the first bank in Canada is established, and that is the Bank of Montreal, 1817 BOM. 1818, USA gives up fishing by Newfoundland, so I guess it worked. USA ships are only allowed to dock in emergencies now. Competitive trade emerges with the West Indies. Now, in 1818, we have two major acts. We have the U.S. Navigation Act, which closed U.S. ports to British ships. Now, Britain responds to this with the British Freeport Act, and which allows Americans to import into British North America. So they did the exact opposite. In 1819, we see rising from Staples, and we see the Lachine Company. In the 1820s, there's a huge increase in timber shipping. Forward linkages emerge from timbering, and we see the Welland Canal opening. Now, the Welland, Can the Welland Canal could not accommodate bigger boats. Later in time, the Welland Canal was expanded, and the business community was mostly French. 1820s, so this is the early 1820s, the planters disappear. Fishing becomes family-oriented. Salt cod demand falls, and now the reason for the salt the salt cod demand falling is because fishing became more family oriented, and smaller families did not have the skills or technology to salt the cod properly, so it wasn't very fresh and didn't taste very good. Still, at this time, Newfoundland cod fishing slumps due to competition and Newfoundland sloppy curing techniques. So yet again, it's because of uh, not knowing how to cure properly. 1824, Newfoundland officially becomes a British colony. Local firms become more competitive and British companies leave. Newfoundland's fishing and sealing led to shipbuilding, which is a reverse linkage. Now in the 1830s, there is the agreement of the US and Britain about opening ports. At this time, agri agriculture stays underdeveloped in the Maritimes due to focus on staples. So heavy focus on staples didn't really contribute to too much development. It is the backbone of Canada's economy and Canada's history, but it didn't lead to too much development. At this time, in the 1830s, oats became more important than potatoes in Prince Edward Island. Now, Nova Scotia, they farmed in the north, they fished in the south, and the interior was mainly focused on forestry. They were the most diversified, whereas New Brunswick was the least diversified, and they only focused on the staple. In 1830s, Quebec becomes an importer of wheat, and beef and dairy are very significant for Quebec. 1834, 25% of the houses are still made of log and clay. Even though we see a lot of technological development, 25% of the houses are still log and clay. Between the 1830s and the 1840s, Lower Canada is not doing so well because the wheat midge ravaged the crops. So remember, Lower Canada is actually north of Ontario. The standard of living dropped as the wheat midge ravaged the crops, and thousands leave to New England. The financial and all-round financial infrastructure starts to develop. Fur traders at this time expanded and settled the Niagara and Kingston region. We see a lot of fur traders and hunters settling the areas because they are in hunt of game and they follow game. Now my last point, uh, is going to be 1854. This is the last part, I believe, where uh, the material covers before your midterm. So 1854, some of New France survives. Uh, the seigneurial system, we see that we see the seigneurial system kind of slumping, 
and Quebec is under authoritarian power until 1871. At this time, 80% of the population in Canada resides in rural residences, and at this time, the British have monetary stability. So that's it for a chronological order of things. Please view the narrative version of this. It's kind of a story of all the important events and how one leads into another and how one affects another. It is very well done. I believe that it will help significantly in your studies. Thanks a lot.